Dando continuidade ao ciclo de palestras públicas oferecidas pelo INPE, pelo Instituto Serra Pilheira, hoje é um prazer recebermos o professor Tadashi Tokieda, de Stanford University, que vai apresentar sua palestra Toy Models in uh, Small Mathematics in a Big World. Tadashi tem uma história, uma trajetória bastante curiosa. Ele começou como pintor no Japão, se tornou um filólogo clássico na França e um matemático na Inglaterra. De Oxford, ele seguiu para Princeton e, bom, dali para alguns dos grandes centros de matemática do mundo, como Cambridge e Harvard, até se mudar recentemente, se fixar em Stanford. Paralelamente ao seu trabalho de pesquisa, Tadashi tem sido muito ativo na disseminação de matemática, como, por exemplo, participando do African Institute of Mathematics, na África do Sul, e com vídeos no canal do YouTube Number File, vídeos que já contam com mais de 10 milhões de visualizações. É, Tadashi tem estudado brinquedos matemáticos que encantam tanto crianças quanto jovens e matemáticos experientes. Dono de um fino senso de humor e um olho especial para identificar a surpresa em sistemas simples e cotidianos, mas com uma matemática muito rica, ele tem apresentado esses brinquedos em palestras extremamente cativantes. Então, sem mais delongas, Tadashi Tokieda and his toy models. Billions of people from around the globe every morning drink from a cup like this. And one morning, after the morning tea, I took a spoon and tried tapping on the cup. Slide, please. Slide, please. And, oh, where is the uh, advance? Okay. So, we seem to get the same pitch from all over the cup. Wherever we tap, those four points all give you the same ding, 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 that kind of pitch. So, perhaps it's the characteristic pitch of the cup, and if you take another cup, uh, you get another pitch. But then, it occurred to me to tap somewhere different, 45 degrees off. The camera, please. Okay, um, slide please. We get a slightly higher pitch, perhaps half a note or so. So from those four points on the left, a low pitch, and four points on the right, higher pitch. What is going on? Camera please. In order to understand what is going on, I would like to first um, do it in two steps. The first step is going to be why any four points that form the vertices of a square seem to produce the same sound, whichever four they are. And then, later on, we'll have to understand why high, why low, and so on. So let's do the first part, why four points vertices of a square always produce the same sound. And in order to do this, we have to forget the handle. So please forget, and please pretend that the handle is not there. And now, you see, when I tap here, for example, this point starts oscillating. And in response, the point diametrically opposite can do one of the two things. It can oscillate like this out of phase, or oscillate like this in phase. However, the first of those two, out of phase oscillation, is like moving the entire cup as a single rigid body. And so it doesn't change the shape of the cup. And you know, on the other hand, that the sound has everything to do with the deformations of a body in rapid oscillation. That is why uh, something vibrates and you can hear the wave from the, from the air. So this response, which does not change the shape of the cup, to a good appro approximation, does not partake in the production of the sound. Therefore, what primarily is producing sound is this response in phase. But you see, the cup, as far as it can help it, wants to keep 
um, be, remain incompressible, not to be confused with incomprehensible. In other words, it wants to keep the same volume at all times. So when those two points go in, in response, those two points perpendicularly situated get pushed out. And when these go out, these get pushed in. And that is why you get this kind of rhombus or lozenge shape oscillation, boom, 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 boom. And that is why you get any four points that form the vertex of a square all singing in unison. It does not matter which one of those you excite, they all sing together. That is the first part, and we understand why they sing in unison. Now, we have to then distinguish between this and this. So clearly, these four have a higher pitch than these four. Why? Let's make the handle come back, which we have been neglecting. Now there's a handle. When you have a handle and you tap any one of those four points, you see, as they oscillate, and they oscillate together as we saw, they have to drag the handle with them, because you see, the handle is attached to one of the oscillating points. In contrast, what happens when those points oscillate in unison? Well, you remember how it goes. This goes in, and this goes out. This goes in, and this goes out, and so on. The point exactly in between is what is called a node to a good approximation. It's not moving. So as far as those four points are concerned, it's as if the handle is not there. So you now have two elastic systems. You can think of them as springs of the same stiffness. One is attached to a heavy mass. It has to drag this heavy mass. And the other one is attached to nothing at all. So when you release them, what do you hear? The heavy spring will go boom, 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 boom. And the light spring will go hee ho, hee ho. And that's the difference in the pitch that you get. This slider, please. So far, we knew what the cup looked like its properties and so on, and we try to understand the sound that emerged from it, the pattern of the sound. The inverse problem, the inverse problem is also interesting. Namely, since we're talking about a pitch, let's imagine that we're in a pitch dark room. We don't see anything, it's totally dark. We don't see um, what the cup looks like. However, suppose that we're allowed to walk around the cup and tapping it all over the place and to keep uh, recorded data of the sound that emerges from various points of the cup. And the question is, from that recorded data of the sound, can you reconstruct what the object looks like, the mass distribution and all that? You see, in most problems that you encounter in the beginning of science, you are solving the problem forward. You, you have some phenomenon, and you want to model it, typically with partial differential equations and things like that, and you try to solve the problem forward and predict what's going to happen in the phenomenon. This is the inverse. This is in retroactive motion. Namely, we have a lot of data. We can collect the data, and we want to figure out what is causing, what is the mechanism that produced this data? So we have to work backward. And if you think about it, much of science and indeed life in general consists in solving inverse problems. So it is epistemologically a really important class of problems. And here, already in this simple example of a cup, you can see that the inverse problem can be very tricky. You can solve it so nicely because you now agree with me that, in fact, it doesn't really matter where the handle is. As long as they are shifted by 90 degrees, east, north, west, or south, you get the same pattern of oscillation, don't you? So you would get, in the ground state, at least in the lowest energy mode, the same pitch. So you can't tell up to 90 degree rotation where the handle is. But it's even worse, so it's even more interesting. Instead of having a single handle, you can have two medium handles facing each other, or four small handles at the vertices of a square, and again, you get the same symmetry, the same geometry, and the same sound of pattern. So you can't even tell the number of handles. It's a problem, but up to symmetry, you can start saying something. And this is very, very typical in any class of um, inverse problems. You have to first detect and list all the symmetries, and as we like to say, mod out, or go to the quotient space, and then you can start making progress. So far, we have been discussing a single object in oscillation. Now let's raise the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, we are going to have mutually interacting particles. Camera, please. This is a um, soup ball that I, I mean, borrowed from uh, Canteen in Cambridge, and the uh, box that I found on the street market, which 
very, has a very nice decoration. It says in Russian on the cover, Chai Gruzinsky Extra, Georgian tea extra quality. And when you open it, there's another lid inside. This is too small print to read, and also there's a reflection, but I'm going to read it for you. Kak Chai, how to brew a good quality of tea in scientific detail. But that has nothing to do with the experiment I would like to show you. I'm carrying around cedar balls. You know the balls that you put in your closet in order to chase away the insects? One thing that I can say in favor of this experiment is that it smells nice. You can't say that about it many experiments. So I'm going to put some of those balls. And if I put two balls, for example, and swirl this cup, you can see that the balls, those cedar balls, circulate in the direction that I'm swirling. Okay. By the way, when I say swirl, I mean this. I don't mean spin. I am keeping this in the same as unisero direction, and then I'm doing this. It, it goes around around in circulation in the same direction. But now, if I increase the number of balls and swirl again, the balls circulate in the opposite direction. So there was a phase transition. With one ball, of course, the circulation is the same direction as the swirl. Two balls, three balls, they are the same direction. Four balls, no problem. But five, it's still going fine. But at six, there's a lot of hesitation. In fact, so much that you don't know which way they are going. At seven, fairly suddenly, you can see the beginning of the opposite circulation. And eight, it is very, very clear. And so on and so on. So this changed the direction of the circulation in response to the swell. Very, very interesting. And it's really like a phase transition. I mentioned the phrase a moment ago. Um, and I would like to argue that it is really like a phase transition that is the change of state from gas to liquid. You see, when you have few balls, what's going on is that these balls get banged against by the wall, and so the wall gives the momentum, and this momentum drives the balls in the direction that I'm swirling. There's no problem. And the balls don't really talk to one another because they are fairly scarce and you know, they are not crowded. On the other hand, so they behave like independent particles, if you like. On the other hand, if I increase the number of balls and they make them crowded, that is the order parameter, the crowdedness, then whatever momentum that comes into the system gets scattered and wasted among the contacts, neighboring contacts of the balls. What is not wasted, however, is that whenever you see a ball is rubbed against by, by the wall, that rubbing makes the ball rotate, and that rotation, because it's in contact with the neighbor, gets transmitted the next ball and so on, like gears. So the rotation, or the spin, gets propagated, diffuses inside, and that is driving this overall motion, really strange uh, opposite circulation of the ball. So, it's behaving like a liquid in as much as, you know, in a gas, you have lots and lots of independent particles minding their own business and flying about, and they are not really interacting. Whereas in a liquid, the particles are in contact with one another, but they can still slide past each other, but the mutual contact really is uh, governing their motion in a very constrained manner. So it is, if you like, a transition from a linear momentum-dominated regime to the angular momentum-dominated regime, and that transition took place when you ch um, change the order parameter that is the crowdedness. And to show you that it is really like um, phase transition, if you keep increasing the number of balls and make them really crowded, it freezes solid also. Okay, good. So that was uh, an interaction of multiple particles, and there was a transition that took place as a, a function of some parameter, at some sudden transition, now we shall witness a much worse kind of transition, or a more exciting kind of transition. After all, when the transition took place, the balls could go somewhere, it start, they started circling in the opposite direction, but now we'll block the exit, and it will be very mean to the physics. The system can't do anything else and see how the system breaks. I brought here two heptagons, regular seven gons, seven, regular polygons with seven sides, and I'd like to, these were made by Andy Ruina, by the way, of Cornell University, but the previous experiment I learned from Rehberg of Bayreuth. And these two objects I brought, I can guarantee to you three features of these objects. Number one, they are made of the same alloy of metal, same material, and also the surface coating is exactly identical. Number two, they have the same mass, they weigh exactly the same. Number three, I'll say something slightly delicate. 
the mass distribution within each is exactly uniform and homogeneous. That is, the shape that you see is exactly how the mass is distributed. I mean, you might start you know, asking, well, because Tadashi is a mean magician, maybe there's going to be a cavity hidden, hidden in the middle, or maybe the spokes will be heavier than the rim, and so on. No, there's nothing hidden like this. Um, what you see is exactly how the mass is distributed. There is no cheating. I haven't started cheating in this talk yet. And yet, these things to look very, very identical. But when I try to roll them, one of them rolls with alacrity very, very nicely, whereas the other one refuses to roll altogether. I try to roll it, but it stops, and if I force it, it falls flat. I'm going to pull both of them at the same time. One of them rolls very nicely, and the other one does not roll. And yet, they look exactly identical. So what is the difference? Now, before you come up with theories of what is different about them, please note the following. Whatever difference you are going to come up with is likely to be very small, because after all, at first sight, you cannot see the difference. And you have to convince yourself that such a small difference is capable of producing such a dramatic difference in the behavior. After all, in most circumstances of life, we are accustomed to believe, if you have a tiny, tiny cause, the an effect will be very tiny. And if you, have a, if you want to produce a big effect, we want to have a big, big cause, and so on. So, whatever difference you might come up with is certainly invisible to the naked eye, and yet, their dynamic behaviors are totally qualitatively different. Now, because you are all very nice people, and with the permission of Andy, I'd like to give away the secret for free. And the, what is different between them is that they are not exactly heptagons, or to be precise, one of them isn't. The one that does not roll, refuses to roll, is an exact heptagon. All the sides are straight, and there are seven sides. In contrast, the one that does roll, rolls very happily, is not quite a heptagon, but it's a heptagon where I bulged out each of the sides slightly outward to make it strictly convex, you know, a little bit. But that epsilon, that's the term that we use in mathematics for denoting small quantity, that epsilon difference is really, really small. It's of order of one hundredth of a millimeter. Uh, so it's, we are measuring that in microns. So tiny, tiny, tiny difference outside. Can we have the slide, please? Let's discuss then what that tiny difference can make, bulging out the size. Can we have the slide, please? Thank you. Let's take the one that does roll. So I drew here a heptagon, but whose sides are slightly rounded to outside. When you do that, Let's say that you start from some vertex or some corner of the heptagon, and the heptagon is trying to roll over. As it does, the point of contact can transit smoothly and continuously to the next corner because, you see, it's curved ever so slightly, so the point of con contact transits to the next one, and shtong, 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 it can go to the next one. And this is fine, however small that epsilon is, the con point of contact can move. In contrast, suppose that this epsilon is zero, that is, we have a strictly straight size of the heptagon. Then, when you start from one corner and the entire thing is starting to roll, where the point, point of contact cannot move, it's stuck at that corner because the entire uh, line is straight. So, you know, it tilts, tilts this, but the point of contact is still in the beginning, in the initial point, it tilts this until bang, it contacts, it bangs against the floor, and then the entire energy is lost and kills the motion. Yeah. So this is the difference, and the remarkable thing is that that difference takes place however small epsilon is on the one hand and when epsilon is zero. In other words, we are accustomed to think, as I began to say, that when you have a parameter in the system, in your theory, and as you change the parameter a little bit, the behavior of the system, behavior of the phenomenon will change a little bit. Um, I, I, I hear some message from above. And the, but in this case, you have a discontinuity in the behavior of the phenomenon as a function of the parameter. Epsilon 0, 0.00001, 0, 
where all the thing rolls, 0.0000000001, it still rolls. But when you put epsilon equals zero, suddenly it does not roll. Very remarkable. Of course, all of that depends on how hard the surface is and so on. And this was designed for this size and also a heptagon, so that on a typical wooden table, you get this uh, difference in a dramatic fashion. That kind of breakage, if you like, when the theory breaks down at some value of a parameter is called a singular perturbation. And this is one of the banes, or if you like, one of the greatest challenges of applied mathematics to physics. So the limit of the model is not the behavior of the model at the limit. We are going to um, go on exploring worse and worse, or if you like, better and better um, singularities. But in the meantime, let's make a digression. We were talking about heptagon, so I'd like to digress to show you how to make a regular polygon. You know, you might have some memory from high school, some of you are still in high school, of using a ruler and compass to draw a regular uh, polygon. Well, some of them can be done, some of them cannot be done. This was discovered by Gauss, and you cannot draw every regular n-gon for all n. n has to be, has to, is related with something called Fermat primes, uh, something of the form 2 to 2 to something plus 1. But I'd like to show you that with origami, you can do any n. So what you do is to take a strip of paper and tie the simplest knot you can imagine, like so. Having tied this knot, you tighten it, tighten it, and then flatten it at the same time. You tighten and flatten, you tighten and flatten. You have to keep negotiating and tighten and flatten. And eventually, you get a completely tight and flat knot. And Observe what's in here. In order to show you better, I'm going to throw away the bits that are sticking out and tuck these in. You get a very nice regular pentagon. And what is very beautiful about this um, construction, if it can be called a construction, is that I didn't have to do anything. Nature took, ever, took care of everything. Can we have the slide, please? Slide, please. So, in general, how do you do this? Well, you notice that I made a, the simplest knot. In other words, I made a one pass through the knot, and then tightened and flattened, and that gave me a regular pentagon. Suppose that you make two passes through the knot, the next one in complexity. Now, what do you mean by two passes? Well, you have to do it in systematic fashion, and there's a picture that is drawn there. And when you do two passes and then flatten and tighten, you get automatically a regular seven-gon, heptagon, the kind of thing that we ha were having there. And three passes, you have guessed it, nine-gon, uh, four passes, 11-gon. 11 is not um, constructible with rule and compass, and so on and so on. So in general, you can do any regular odd-gon. You are going to say, ah, but you missed one of the most important uh, odd numbers. What about the regular trigon that is an equilateral triangle? Well, you can do that too. And here is the picture. You come in, and you try to make a knot, but you don't manage, and you go out. And in that corner, behind that uh, shade, is hiding the equilateral triangle, regular trigon. So any regular oddgon can be made. And once you have n equal odd, um, it's very, very easy with origami to dissect, bisect all the angles. You just fold it in two. So you can double the number of sides, so you can access all n as well. That was a digression. OK. Now, um, we pursue the theme of singularity and go to the next experiment. Every once in a while, you run into a person who happens to be carrying around an, an inclined plane. and the, and here, I have brought several jars. One of the jars is filled with delicious rice, uh, basmati rice from India. And another jar is filled with delicious air from Rio de Janeiro. So you can say, this is full, this is empty, one and zero, 100% and 0%, as it were. Now, I shall try to let them roll down this slope. Ready? It rolls down quite fast, rather briskly, and this one also rolls down. Well, well, not exactly the same way because the moment of inertia is doing something, over-educated people will say, but they go down quite fast, that is true, and more or less at the same rate. What I would like to investigate is what is the pace of rolling down, what's the pace of descent, as a function of the amount of stuff in there, of the fraction of filling. So we already have two data points. 
when the jar is zero, uh, that is, is completely empty, or when it's 100%, when it's full, you go up quite fast. Yeah? So you have two data points up there. Well, what happens when it's half empty or half full, um, depending on your, on your optimism, um, where will the graph be? So let's do an experiment. In order to make the experiment more efficient, I brought here one jar which is two-thirds full and one jar which is one-third full. So let's do the two-thirds. There are now three possibilities out there. Well, what's going to happen to this one then? How will it go down? Maybe it will go down faster than 0, 1. Those are the references. Maybe it will be the champion faster. Or maybe it will go down slower than 0, 1. That is also a possibility. Maybe it will be the most sluggish one. Or if you believe in that story of Galileo Galilei dropping two unequal masses from the Tower of Pisa and they're landing on the ground at the same time, maybe the descent rate to a good approximation does not depend so significantly on the amount of stuff, on the filling inside. So it's independent of the amount. And so it's going to go down at the same rate as 0, 1. So let's take a vote. Who thinks this will go down faster than the other two? Who thinks it will go down faster? OK, almost uh, some brave people there. Who thinks it will go down slower than the other two? Ah, congratulations. This is the option that the most reasonable citizens go for. And then who thinks it will go down at the same rate as 0, 1? OK, so those people think that there's no point to this experiment. Well, never mind. OK, so let's do this. All right. This is 2 thirds. When I release it, it goes down very, very slowly. Very, very slowly. Not only does it go down slowly, it's making a lot of noise as it goes down. There's a lot of movement of the grains happening inside. We'll come back to that. If you look at the, probably this camera is not, doesn't have high enough resolution, there's a lot of avalanche going on the surface of the, uh, of the grains, there's, and that's making this sound. We'll come back to this. In the meantime, Let's try the one third. Now there are four possibilities. <laughs> OK. So maybe it will be the fastest, the champion. So it will be faster than 0, 1, or a fortiori, uh, 2 thirds. Or maybe it will be the slowest so far, really slow. Or maybe it will be faster than 2 thirds. After all, 2 thirds was very slow, but slower than 0, 1. So in between the previous two experiments. Or if you have a beautifully symmetric mind, you might think uh, there must be some symmetry between f and 1 minus f, if you see what I mean. So you know, 1 third and 2 thirds, or 1 fifth and 4 fifths, and so on. Maybe they go down at the same rate. There's, by the way, already one data point, which is that 1 half and 1 half go down at the same rate. So maybe they go down at the same rate. It will go down at the same rate as 2 thirds. So let's take a vote. Who thinks that one third will be the fastest so far? so far? Really fast. OK, very brave people. And who thinks it will go down the slowest of all so far? OK. Now, who thinks it will go down faster than two thirds, which was really slow, but slower than 0, 1? In between. Ah, that is what the good citizenry usually um, um, chooses. And congratulations on your moral behavior. And finally, who has a symmetric mind and thinks that there will be a symmetry between two thirds and one third? OK, and quite a few people. All right, so let's try this. Nothing up here, nothing up here. So I'm going to do the one third. Ready? I'm going to release. It's <laughs> it stops completely dead. Not only that, even if I try to cajole it to come down, it's very, very reluctant. It just stops. So you get absolutely zero. OK, can we have the slide, please? Well, we have to understand, why did this uh, two-thirds, or pretty much full one, slow down? And more spectacularly, why did that uh, one-third one, uh, very few grains, get immobilized? We'll do it in two stages again. And the first stage is static. And this is actually a beautiful but little practiced science of granular materials. You probably remember, or maybe you have done it recently, going to a beach. What I'm saying, we are in Rio de Janeiro, of course. So you go to the beach, and then you want to make a sand pile. Mind you, I'm talking about the dry sand. Because with wet sand, you can make all sorts of strange sculptures, but dry sand. You want to make a pile, you want to make a mountain of dry sand. And it is a matter of childhood experience that you cannot make the sand pile too steep. There is some kind of maximum steepness, maximum angle. And if you want to make something steeper than that, try 
the entire sample avalanches or landslides and collapses to something that has a smaller angle. Yeah, you know what I mean? Okay. By the way, um, this is a digression, but when I was a child um, in Japan, I noticed that while making sand piles, there was a critical steepness, but if I mixed in to the sand needles of pine, so you know, pine needles, those are leaves, pine like leaves of, uh, 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 sorry, needle like le leaves of pine, then if you mix a little bit, nothing happened. If you mix a little more, nothing happened, but at some critical um, fraction of mixture, suddenly this angle jumped and became very, very interesting. And anyway, so this is another experiment to do. In any case, that critical angle, the maximum angle of steepness that can be accommodated by a sand pile, by a pile of grains, is called angle of repose. It's a technical term, and I will denote it by alpha. You also know the behavior of a liquid. Well, usually liquid, for example, water, if you let it calm, it's going to be completely flat, so the angle of repose is zero. What about something like honey or syrup? Actually, honey or syrup, you can make a little mound yeah, temporarily, but if you wait long enough, that mound sort of collapses and becomes eventually settles into a flat surface, so horizontal surface. So the angle of repose, if you wait long enough, is strictly zero for any liquid. This already shows that actually there is a very, very interesting challenge that's facing science. First of all, I'd like to point out this, that this angle of repose, of course, is a characteristic of any grain. You know, if you use, for example, basmati rice, it's one thing. If you use um, Japanese rice, it's another. If you use sand of a certain kind, it's another thing. And if you use flour, it's another kind of thing, and so on. Every grain has this angle of repose. But this angle of repose depends only on the shape of the grains, not on the size. If you change the size of the grain, the angle of repose does not change. I'd like to prove this to you. Are you ready? So the claim is that the angle of repose does not depend on the size of the grain. OK, here's the proof. Suppose that you have a pile, you made it, and you have an angle of repose. If I stand very, very far away and look at it, those grains look small, don't they? And if I come really close, they look really large, but the angle is the same, QED. OK, so it does not depend on the size. All right, but it does depend on the shape of the grains. And what is quite interesting is this size independence is quite remarkable, because if you are naive, as I used to be, in fact, I'm still naive, um, you want to um, study the dynamics or the physics of grains, say grains can flow and so on, you know, sand, um, sandstorm and so forth, as some kind of um, approximation or some kind of a limit case of fluid mechanics, mechanics of fluids, you know, air, gas and, and liquid and so on, which is a very, very well-developed science. Well, you might say, well, you know, you write down something for the grains, and you, as you take the size to zero, the theory should converge to the theory of fluid mechanics. It doesn't work that way because when you make the size smaller and smaller, smaller, that alpha, the angle of repose, is always constant, constant, constant. But when the size of the grain becomes zero, that is, in the fluid approximation, suddenly it collapses to zero. So there is a singular perturbation, singular limit there too. Okay? So you cannot get um, granular and fluid connection by just this approximation, by just taking the limit. Okay. Now, let's go on. Why did the so this almost full one slow down, and if you had few grains, it did it get immobilized? Here's why. Here I've drawn a picture of a jar which is almost full. So let's say you know, it's not two-thirds, it's even more. If it's almost full, the center of gravity of the whole thing is almost in the middle, isn't it? So that's denoted by a green dot. Please note also the red dot, it's rather small, and that's the point of contact between the jar and the slope. Okay, between the jar and slope. And, of course, the gravity is pulling down on that pile, uh, on that uh, jar of, of, uh, of grains, downward. I believe that even in Rio de Janeiro, gravity pulls down. But you see that the gravity is pulling down to the downhill side, or in that picture, to the right-hand side of the point of contact. So, gravity pulls down, and its torque, that is the effect, um, its effect to rotate, is going to help the thing roll down, because it's going to induce, a count, so in that picture, clockwise rotation. Let's contrast this with the other case. When you have few grains, well, if you have few grains, you might arrange the situation so that the center of gravity of the grains is to the left or on the uphill side of, this, of the point of contact. Now something interesting happens. The gravity is still pulling down. 
However, the rolling effect, that is the torque due to gravity, is such that it makes the whole thing roll upward in that picture, counter or anti-clockwise. So gravity is pulling down, but the effect is to push the whole thing up. Can we have the camera, please? Camera, please. So I'd like to show you that this is indeed happening. If I release it from the right position, you'll see initially it's going to be very subtle, so please pay attention. I'm going to release it to start begin by going up a little bit. Do you see that? You, it oscillates a little bit. You see it oscillates, and then it, it tries to find its equilibrium. So it can actually go up. And that effect, torque, fights the uh, gravity that is trying to push it down. That is why it can't stop. Can we have the slide, please? And this effect can occur only if the angle of repose that we talked about, that was alpha, green alpha, is greater than the slope that you have, the angle of the slope, which is beta. Yeah. And you can think about the limit case when the angle of repose is exactly zero, that is, for example, for a liquid. Well, if you have the flat top surface, the center of gravity is always in the middle, and so it's always going to be on the downhill side of the point of contact, so it will go, always go down. Nonetheless, it's actually quite interesting. I did it at home to do the experiment with this, uh, this slope with honey. Because you know, I did it with honey, and I put it, and I thought it would just go down very, very slowly. But that's not what happens. I watch it, and it doesn't move. I watch it a little longer, it doesn't move. It doesn't move. Um, you know, watch the jar does not move, apparently. So I get bored and go off and have coffee. And when I came back half an hour later, it moved a certain distance. <laughs> so it turns out that what it does is it's not, instead of going slowly down, somehow it's stationary. But then there's a, a little, very, very gentle flow inside. And at some point, it goes stonk by a discrete amount. And then it st stops there and goes stonk. There's an intermittency that appears from this continuous system. It's quite interesting. OK. Now, let's uh, think about the following picture then. So we have been um, drawing the graph, mentally, of the pace of descent against how full the jar is. And we already know that at 0 and 100, it is quite high. But in the middle, we discover there's a whole basin, shall I say, of immobility. That is quite exciting. On the right of the basin of immobility, suppose that you start from the immobile region, but you step a little bit sideways to the right, toward 100%. Of course, you start rolling. That was the case with 2 thirds. And in that rolling, I alluded to this, there's an interesting motion inside dynamics of the grains inside a jar. And what you see is that there's an avalanche, there's a sigmoidal curve in the profile, and there's an avalanche which is making a lot of noise and which is dissipating uh, uh, energy. In, whereas in the rest of the jar, all the grains seem to be stuck on the inner wall of the jar. And if you have studied fluid mechanics, this is what is called the model of viscous fluid mechanics. Along the inside wall, there's a no-slip condition. And on the surface, there's a lot of dissipation, there are lots of energy loss, and that is why it's slowing down. So it's viscous or gooey or sticky fluid mechanics. There is some kind of internal friction inside the system. Okay. If you step on the left, what happens? That is, if you start from that region of uh, immobility, but then you decrease the grains more and more. Well, eventually, the jar rolls down, because when it's zero, it rolls. So let's try that experiment. Camera, please. Here is now a jar with very, very few grains. So two, one third that we have tried was this. And there are even fewer grains, as you can see, and almost none, actually. And I'm going to let it roll. But this time, the way it rolls down, it does roll down, is going to be quite different from the way two thirds roll down. Here's what it is. I don't know if you can see. I think that you can just about see. There's a lot of rickety motion of the grains inside. All the grains behave as if they were one single body, and then sort of slide back and forth, back and forth inside a jar. You can see this. Yeah, you can see the oscillation inside. So the grains are sliding, no, instead of no stick, no, no slip, they're sliding inside a jar. And there is no avalanche on the surface. They are just all behaving like a, 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 like a fluid. So this is a very, very remarkable thing. Um, slide, please. If we step to the left, 
Yes, the jar starts rolling down, but the way it rolls down is qualitatively different from the way it rolls down on the right. All the grains stick together, or are, are just like one rigid body, and it slides, and there's a rickety sort of sliding motion back and forth, and then there's no avalanche. So fluid dynamicists will say it's behaving like an inviscid fluid, that is, fluid for which viscosity is zero. Now, it's one of the greatest challenges or mathematical difficulties of fluid mechanics that the theory of inviscid regime and theory of viscous regime are mathematically incompatible. You can't go from one to the other by taking limits. This is really one of the worst cases or exciting cases of singular limit. And this roll and rolling jars with grains with on a longer, a longer, a longer uh, slope, to my knowledge, is the simplest physical and actual physical experiment which accommodates two mathematically incompatible phenomena within the same system. Yeah. So this is, was done in uh, collaboration with Nicolas Taberlet of the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon, a very, very smart young physicist. And what we're doing is to change the parameters and conditions of the system so that as to shrink that region of immobility more and more and force the inviscid regime and the viscous regime to meet those two mathematically incompatible cases to meet physically, and then Mother Nature will have some really hard decision-making to do. So we want to see the mathematics break under the pressure of physics and see what happens. We would like to see this. Okay. Now, that was um, a really bad example or exciting example of uh, singular limit, but here is a new um, experiment. I'm going to do this. And uh, your inspection is a traditional Japanese toy. It's a paper ba balloon made of paper. And you can see that there's a hole in there. I blow into the hole. And that's how I uh, make it round. However, there's another way of making it round. I can wrinkle it. And then I start tossing it in a random fashion. Now, don't you have the impression that if you hit on a, an object repeatedly, you sh you're denting it? And by denting it, you should make it less and less round. Huh? You should make it less and less convex. But look at what's happening. As I randomly hit it from all sides, it became round. So you have now a way of making something round by trying to dent it. <laughs> what can be more absurd than this? By the way, in case you're wondering about this, I did an experiment. It takes much, much longer. I can shrink it like this. and. Put it in, putting it on the surface, for example, on the table, I can poke at it from all sides with my fingers. That's really, really severe, right? You are really denting it. But nonetheless, I have to do it for 30 minutes or so. That's why I'm not demonstrating today. But nonetheless, even if you poke with a finger, you think that it's going to get dented all over the place. But no, it became much rounder and rounder. So it is really strange. Uh, a counterexample, a counterintuitive way of making something rounder by poking on it. Okay. So what is happening here? And this turns out to be another example of singularity. Here is a really nice uh, cartoon picture. The key to understand this, actually, let's hold it. Can we have the camera, please, for a moment? Look at what happens when I shrink it, really. It doesn't stay shrunk. When I release, watch what happens. It starts fighting back a little bit. It starts coming back. Not all the way back, only a little, but it does have some memory. It has some kind of interesting viscoelastic behaviors. Like say, it has some memory, it wants to come back. OK, that's key. Can we have the slide, please? So let's imagine that you have this balloon, wrinkled left and right, more or less in equal measure, and I hit it from the left. What happens? The side that I hit, because I hit it, becomes super wrinkled, even more wrinkled. The other side, on the other hand, gets puffed out by recoil, so it gets round, it gets smoother. But now, that memory of the paper comes into play. While I wait, the left-hand side that got super wrinkled starts coming back a little bit and recovers some of the smoothness that he had. It relaxes from super wrinkles. So you can see that per cycle, what you have is both sides were pretty much wrinkled, but one side got super wrinkled, the other side got smooth, but then super wrinkled side 
comes back to the original degree of wrinkleness. So overall, you increase the smoothness of the surface. And if you do it from all sides, you get more smoother and smoother surface. And that's the um, graph. If you plot the volume, which is a good measure of how smooth the surface is, after all, when you have maximum volume, it's totally smooth. That's a sphere as a function of time. Each time I hit, suddenly the volume goes down. I wrinkle it. But then there's a recovery phase, and then hit recover, hit recover, and then you asymptote to this sphere. This system, which has never been analyzed as far as I know, is quite interesting. You see, throughout science, there are many, many situations. Uh, the slide, please, sorry, not the, not the camera. Throughout science, there are many, many systems that have multi scales. You know, large scale, medium scale, small scale, tiny scale, microscopic scale, all living together happily and talking with one another. The most famous of those um, multi scale systems is called turbulence or fluid flow. So you have a very, very large swirl or vortex living in there, and then more medium sized vortices, and then small sized vortices, and tiny, tiny sized vortices, and tiny, tiny sized vortices, and so forth, and they're all sort of um, talking to each other. But because any real fluid is viscous, really tiny vortices cannot be sustained. They just get smoothed out by viscosity, and then lose the energy and get smoothed out. So, in order to make turbulence last, what you have to do is what is called a cascade. The energy must be passed down from the large scale to the medium scale. In turn, the medium scale passes the energy down to smaller scale. Smaller scale passes some of the energy down to tiny scale. And at the bottom, the energy goes out into heat. But you have to keep pumping the, or if you like, cascading down the energy. Or in practice, somebody at the top must be stirring the soup. Okay? Otherwise, it, that's not going to keep going. And this kind of a picture is extremely common. It can be energy that goes down, it can be momentum that goes down, it can be information that goes down, but whenever you have multi-scale system, there is a cascade, and the cascade is almost always, in natural systems, from large to small. Now, in case there are people who are over-educated in fluid mechanics, yes, in 2D turbulence, it's inverse. But you see, 2D turbulence doesn't have vortex stretching and so on. It's really mathematically interesting, but it's not physically a, a really typical example. But anyway, so in all systems, you have a cascade from large to small. This paper balloon, however, ladies and gentlemen, shows an inverse cascade. After all, initially you had tiny, tiny, tiny wrinkles. So we are talking about the cascading of wrinkles. Yeah? But these tiny wrinkles give way to give some of their energy, if you like, or constraint, to stress to medium-sized wrinkles. And then medium-sized wrinkles get longer wrinkles. What does a long wrinkle mean? That means that, OK, the shape is a little you know, wonky compared with the sphere, but it's no longer really shriveled all over the place. And gradually, the length of the wrinkle becomes comparable to the diameter of the sphere, and it just disappears at the top. So there is a passing of, if you like, wrinkliness or information from a small scale to the medium to the it goes in the opposite direction. And to my knowledge, this is, again, the only natural example of inverse cascading that occurs in a multi-scale sort of scale system. And this is very, very interesting because this has to do with the morphogenesis, the shaping of the sphere upstairs by just a random input that from downstairs. Okay. Those are examples of many, many examples of singularity. Can we have the camera, please? And we are going to finish with a final and really famous example of um, singularity. When you drop a coin, it makes a very characteristic noise. It's so characteristic that when you hear this noise in a restaurant or bar, you know, ah, somebody dropped a coin. OK. Here is a really exaggerated coin. I'm going to zoom in there. Very, very heavy. And I should probably pass it on to uh, Marcelo. Is it heavy? Very heavy. Uh, thank you very much. So the president of the organizing committee says it's very heavy. All right. So it's very, very heavy. And you don't imagine the kind of trouble I get into going through airport securities and so on. Now, because it's very heavy, when I launch it, the motion lasts a long time. And because it lasts a long time, you see some details that escape us with an ordinary coin. I'm going to interview this 
thing. You see, it's going faster and faster, but you can see from the picture on the surface that it's actually not spinning any faster. Spin is exactly constant. Nonetheless, something else is accelerating, going faster and faster, going faster and faster. And it's not being driven by anything. It's purely inertial. I don't have any motor underneath. There's no magnet. I'm not sort of putting my Japanese energy into it. I mean, it's just going by itself. And something's going faster and faster. It's also lasting longer than I thought. But it will come to a stop in a moment. And when it does, please not only watch what happens, but listen to the sound. Faster and faster. Faster and faster. It's going only by itself. I'm not doing anything. And you can hear. Now listen. went through the roof. Actually, you don't have to have the table. OK, so there's a lot of dispersion. That is really remarkable. And now, this problem became very popular about 15 years ago. And lots and lots of people worked on this. And the, um, can we have the camera still? Thank you. Lots of people worked on this, and many papers were written. And there was, in particular, one paper that came in which became famous and which claimed that this um, you know, strange rising pitch, which seems to diverge and goes through the roof, has to do with the friction of the air trapped underneath a disk. The experts call it the lubrication theory. Now, many people didn't like this. For example, I think there was a team from California writing in saying that they did the same experiment in a vacuum chamber. And of course, because it's vacuum, you don't hear the sound. But they saw the characteristic shudder to a halt and the increasing frequency at the end. But as the objection was raised at that time, actually, that's not a terribly conclusive experiment. Because you know, already it was known to Maxwell in the 19th century that you might think if you start pumping the air out and making a better and better vacuum, the viscosity or the stickiness of the air decreases. But that's not the case. It turns out that if you plot viscosity as a function of, um, of, uh, of the density, as you become better and better vacuum, the viscosity is almost constant. And only at the very end, when you reach the absolute vacuum, suddenly it drops. You can't get rid of viscosity so easily. And that's because this is a bit technical. But when you pump out the air, of course, you know, you, it gets less viscous because there are fewer collisions among the molecules. At the same time, what is called a mean free path, that is the distance traveled between one collision and the next collision, gets longer and longer. And it turns out that that increase of the mean free path cancels exactly the decrease of the, the, um, of the density and keeps the viscosity pretty much constant. So you cannot do this experiment and conclude that it has to, it, it's, it's not the air just by creating a vacuum, because you have to have a really heck of a good vacuum in order to do this. At that time, I was uh, still a postdoc in Montreal, I believe. And then I had uh, my own theory and worked as a model and wanted to do an experiment. But you see, a vacuum chamber is very expensive. So I went to an accessory shop and bought this. A bracelet. Now, there's no question of the air trapped underneath a disk because there's no disk. <laughs> there's no disk there. By the way, it was rather embarrassing to buy this because I went to this accessory shop and I started spinning one bracelet after another in order to see which one worked better. And a very, very charming vendor came and said, may I help you, sir? <laughs> yes, you may. Now, I'm going to spin this and try to do it in uh, aesthetic fashion. Here it is. It's like a ballerina and standing up, upright, and spinning and spinning. And it's the first, if you like, type of motion. But soon, she'll become tired and start going into the next second type of motion. So please uh, watch. Right now, it's going to transit. OK, now, this is the second type of motion. It's kind of horizontal versus vertical. And here, for all intents and purpose, purposes, it is exactly the same type of motion as we had with, it, with this disk.
Yeah, so it's exactly the same thing qualitatively. And once you notice this, it really becomes an obsession. You know, go to restaurants with me, and then you do this, and so on. I mean, anything that has a circular rim um, will do this, and, and that life is very interesting. OK, so what is going on is the question. First of all, something is wrong, because in the beginning, there was a lot of energy. At the end, all is quiet. Energy is gone. Where did the energy go? And that turns out to be the key. I'd like to argue that the energy goes into what is called phonons. Let me explain. As this, this goes around and around, the point of contact circulates on this mirror, but that point of contact is also the point of pressure. And as the point of pressure executes this periodic motion, it makes the support vibrate. You can come after the lecture and feel it is vibrating quite a lot. And that vibration, if you like, it's sending out elastic waves of phonons which carry off energy which doesn't come back. So it is this, if you like, the earthquake which is carrying off energy which is responsible for the dissipation. To convince you of this, let's do another experiment. I'm going to repeat the experiment. I hope this is going to work. Are you? Okay, are you with me? I'm going to do re repeat the experiment on a good absorber of elastic energy that is a human body. You know, a human body, especially mine, has been designed by nature to withstand all sorts of shocks. So I'm going to support this and then launch this disk on my hand. And so please pay attention to how long this experiment lasts. Are you ready? Go. That's it. Because I have earthed the system through my body to the ground, the entire sort of energies escape through the phonons through my body and got dissipated. And that's how it works. Can we have the, uh, come, uh, the uh, slide, please? OK. So let's analyze this. We noticed that something was going faster and faster and it was not spin. We are going to model this in a simple fashion by regarding this complicated motion of the disk as a superposition, somewhat nonlinear superposition of spin on the one hand, which is constant because there's no angular momentum coming from anywhere, but also this flapping motion. Yeah? And it is this flapping which is responsible for this impression of acceleration. It's flapping faster and faster and faster and faster. By the way, as a result, if you superpose flapping to spin, you get this kind of motion, which is exactly the motion of the disk. And the point of contact goes around faster and faster. And theoretically, it can go around faster than the speed of light. But there's no contradiction with relativity because no information is traveling. It's just a geometric condition which is going around and around. It's an interesting aside. And the good Analogy to have in mind is the famous experiment of a bouncing ball. You drop a ball, let's say a very nice rubber ball, and it goes boing, 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 boing. It gets faster and faster and faster, but it stops in finite time. Beautiful example of a geometric series that converges. So we'd like to propose the analogy between this bounce on the one hand and flap on the other hand. If you like, what we are seeing here is you take this bouncing ball, which is bouncing on that point, so zero-dimensional um, geometric object, and somehow spread it out over a circle, and that is what flap is. Okay. So this is a higher dimensional, if you like, lift of the, uh, of the bounce. Now, let's start the analysis. The energy, I, you know, potential energy, you know, capable of work, doing work and so on, has to do with the height of the system. The higher, the more energy you have. So energy scales like height, but you learn in high school that when you drop something, you know, you travel the vertical distance like one-half times gt squared. So it's proportional to time squared. Time, on the other hand, is inversely proportional to it's the reciprocal of the frequency. One over time is the frequency. One over frequency is time. So this is proportional to bounce frequency to minus two second power. So that's how the energy scales. Now, let's remember what the dissipation mechanism is. I propose that this has to do with phonons, or elastic waves. And we shall measure the time, not from the beginning, but to the end. And that final moment when the Divergence happens, zzz, went through the roof. We shall call T sing because that's the singularity, but also that's the moment when the disk sings. You see, that's the T sing. Okay, so we're going to measure the time to the end, and that's the rate of change of the energy with a minus sign in front. And now we'll make an assumption, we'll make a theoretical input. We'll postulate, and with no experimental evidence whatsoever, this is my idea, this is what's called the ANSATS 
that the rate of dispersion, the rate of change of energy in time with a negative sign, is proportional to flapping frequency. So more flap phase, more energy is being lost. Okay. And that theoretical postulate must be justified by experiments later on. So everything that I'm telling you is very, very robust sort of arithmetic and dimensional analysis, but that's where the theory came in. Okay. But I can identify that flat frequency with the bounce frequency. After all, that was the analogy. So I can relate the rate of change in time of energy to energy itself, and that's very good news. This is what is called the differential equation, and in fact, it's a very simple one, separated type. So you can write down the answer immediately. Energy to three halves, it turns out, a funny power, three halves, 1.5, is proportional to the remaining time, it turns out. But the remaining time, energy is, of course, again, um, negative second power of the frequency, so the upshot is that the frequency that you hear from the system is proportional to the negative one-third power of the remaining time. So as the remaining time shrinks more and more and more, negative one-third power, that means one over something, this thing becomes larger and larger and larger because you are dividing more and more by zero, and then eventually goes up, whoop, but with negative one-third power. And Ariel Amir, who is my collaborator, one of the cleverest young um, um, condensed matter physicists of his generation at Harvard, recorded this. The red line is a theoretical prediction, and the blue wiggles is the experimental data of the record, recording of actually this very disk. And the time is running from right to left, because Ariel is from Israel, and I think in Hebrew you write from right to left. But anyway, so it's going this way. And you see the theory goes smack through the experimental data. I mean, this is really the cleanest data that I've seen in many, many decades. You can't get this kind of clean data for the love of money nowadays. It's really exactly negative one-third power. And this kind of thing is very typical. Can we have the camera, please? Another example of this is those very, very strong magnets, neodymium magnets. And they are very strong. When I pull them apart, they do this. Okay. I can toss them in the air. Oops, they. Oops, that, that's another one. Oh, that was much better. Do you, do you hear this? And if you recall this, the data are not so clean as the case of the disk, but it is still negative one third. So, this negative one third law seems quite universal. Whenever you have a system which dissipates energy, loses energy, by multiple collision, which is getting faster and faster, and as a result is producing a singularity, zzz, it seems to be negative one third. And indeed, apart from that ansatz, everything was very robust, and that ansatz is um, now justified by experimental data. This is an example of what is called a finite time singularity. Something blows up to infinity within finite time. OK, so from one example of singularity to another example of singularity, we got deeper and deeper into worse and worse, or severe and severe examples of singularities, but all in daily life. It's time to conclude this uh, lecture, and I'd like to say the following thing. We have seen through those toys a large swathe of um, interesting phenomena and ideas in mathematical sciences. I listed from chiming, chiming teacup to singing rim, from inverse problems to finite time singularity, and more. All those examples came, and all those um, partook in the production of singularities. Now, I think general public and scientists alike tend to have an impression that science is being done in very, very specialized circumstances and contexts. You know, for example, in specialized laboratories and shiny institutes, you get the information from the internet, and you go to libraries to get journals in classrooms, and of course, in order to get all of this, you have to um, apply for big research grants, and then you submit cutting against proposals and so on. And all of these, shall I say, institutionalized sciences are extremely and supremely important because that's where science comes from. So you're justified in asking me, why are we playing with toys? By way of uh, response, I'd like to share with you an anecdote from a relatively little known work of Aristotle. Um, perizo morion in Greek, and in Latin, de partibus animalium. 
In this uh, work, Aristotle tells an anecdote about Heraclitus. He was one of the pre-Socratic philosophers who flourished about 600 BC, and you know, a great natural philosopher, a star of sciences in those days, if you like. If you like uh, an ancient Greek equivalent of, uh, say, a Fields medalist at the NICM. Okay, so uh, one day, two young people came to see, meet Heraclitus. And of course they imagined maybe a very authoritative, formidable man with a white beard in a lab coat, putting in complex formulas into a supercomputer, or maybe running an entire research lab with lots and lots of people in laboratories and so on. So they imagined all of this. But what they, the Heraclitus they found was different, and they were surprised. This is Aristotle writing. In all natural phenomena, there is something of the marvelous. There is a story that some visitors once wished to meet Heraclitus. And when they entered, saw him in the kitchen, warming himself at the stove and playing with the children, they hesitated. But Heraclitus said, come in, don't be afraid. There are gods even here. It's been a great pleasure and privilege to address this wonderful audience, and especially the young ones, to all of you, and especially to the organizing and people who worked hard to make this uh, ICM a reality, and to many of my friends and teachers in the audience, may I say, obrigado. Bom, como prometido na minha apresentação, Tadashi deu uma palestra estimulante com um fino senso de humor e um sentido de surpresa nos sistemas mais simples e interessantes, capazes de encantar crianças e matemáticos experientes. E eu tenho, não temos tempo para perguntas agora, mas eu tenho certeza de que ele vai ficar muito contente se vocês perguntarem pessoalmente para ele. Tadashi, I'm telling them that you'll be happy to answer personal questions personally after the talk, okay? I think this is, eu acho que ele I concorda. Know. I know. Então, mais uma Vamos agradecer mais uma vez o Tadashi pela bela palestra que ele nos deu.